This is the balanced dilemma. We tackle the often uniquely, but not always, female dilemma, managing life, work, family, and self. I'm Maura Carlin. And I'm Christy Derrico. At The Balanced Dilemma, we speak with women and men to hear their balanced stories. Our guests are entrepreneurs, reinventors, creators, executives, parents, and partners, telling us what we really want to know. How the heck did they manage that? And can you have it all and all at the same time? Our topic today is the college admissions process, something we've touched on before, but after parents have gone to jail, the U.S. Supreme Court knocked out affirmative action in admissions, legacy and athletic admissions are under attack, and it seems that in your community, everyone applies to the same schools. The real question is, what can parents do to get their kids into college legally? We've read the news and the books, and we are sitting down with a college admissions facilitator to get answers to some of our pressing questions. My question, with one left to go, how can I reduce the, this is driving me crazy factor? And that's why we've had our, we have our guest here today. Yes, always want to reduce stress. But first, a word of caution, because neither Christy nor I are admissions counselors or experts, or for that matter, are we medical professionals? We are, however, moms who've been through the process several times over, witnessed and continue to witness others struggling, as well as we are also avid readers on the topic. This discussion reflects our opinions and experience and the research of our guest. And we hope this episode inspires conversation in families and communities. So let me tell you about our guest, Kerry Roberts of Kerry Roberts College Counseling. I met through Thrive Tutoring, who I work with tutoring one of my children. She has more than 20 years of marketing and branding corporate experience. Kerry is applying that expertise to the college admissions process, helping students identify, apply, and be accepted to a college that's a good fit for them. Driven by data, creativity, and compassion, her planning includes customized support for parents and students. She lives in Larchmont, New York, with her husband and two teenage sons who are soon to embark on their own college admission journeys. In other words, she feels your parental pain. Carrie is certified in college counseling through UCLA. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the question that you and I discussed the first time that I spoke with you. And when do we start the process of thinking about college? I know my children took classes in eighth grade that will appear on their transcripts for college applications. Tell us what your opinion is. Well, it's true that um, schools are accelerating things. And so now in middle school, children are expected to take high school classes. And then in high school, they're expected to take college classes. And so we've really accelerated this process, but I do think that there's such a thing as too soon. And I think you have to know your child. You have to know whether they're going to be motivated and inspired by the fact that some of their classes may show up on their college application or whether that's going to add a lot of stress to them. So I think ultimately as parents, you start thinking about it for sure, ninth grade, 10th grade, When you start having those conversations with the children, I think depends on your child, but certainly junior year is the the beginning of starting to think about packaging and positioning your child as a college applicant. So let's talk about that term, packaging, because we don't usually think of our children as something to be packaged. It's a branding concept, isn't it? So talk about that in the context of college admissions. It is. And you're, you're exactly right. And, and I'm a marketer by trade. So I, I think that way. And, you know, the same way that we think of brands. Now that's the way that colleges are thinking about their children. So decades ago, when you and I and we would have applied to schools, we would have been told to be well rounded, we would have done some, you know, volunteer work and, and gotten, you know, good grades. And then what what ended up happening was that really everybody got to college looking pretty much the same. And now colleges are looking for, instead of well-rounded, they're looking for what they call pointy kids. So they want kids who are deeply passionate, 
about different things, different experiences, you know, able to have diverse conversations and really shape um, a campus community of really, really interesting and different kids. So are you saying that they want, okay, the terrific violinist and the scientist and the athlete and people who might have nothing to say to each other or who wouldn't who wouldn't be together on a high in high school i think that i think that the appreciation for what diversity of a campus community can bring to a classroom and a dorm and clubs and teams is definitely a national conversation, not just a university and, and college conversation. I agree that um, colleges are really ne not necessarily thinking that these kids can't be able to talk to each other, but rather that they're going to enrich each other through their different lived experiences. So, you know, having a, a child that actually is an expert at Fortnite, <laughs> that I don't think is what they mean by pointy. And there was an article, uh, you know, one book that we're going to touch on today is Jeffrey Selingo's Who Gets In and Why? A Year Inside the College Admissions Process. And he uses a phrase called a sea of sameness. How do we make our child stand out? How do we make them pointy or, you know, wh what do we need to do to brand them to get them the attention they want in the process? I think the first thing that I'd love parents to appreciate is that we don't need to manufacture our kids, right? We don't need to create or make them pointy. But I think, you know, the earlier that we can support and lift up and cheerlead their authentic passions, guide them towards things where they can demonstrate intellectual curiosity. Um, I happen to have a gamer in my house and he has has gone very deep into that and has a whole community of deep friendships all across the country now these are kids he's never met and they're vastly different and listening to him have these conversations with these kids who he's gotten to know very well i really really now deeply appreciate that experience for him um and so the idea that we have to find a passion project for our kids or, or make them into something, I think we need to take a little bit of that pressure off, but rather let our kids discover what they love to do best. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you properly, are we supposed to take a pad and paper and just write down all the things that our kids like to do and say, okay, this is the thing we want to highlight. This is their authentic self that can work in their favor. What do you suggest? Or let, let me just throw out another option. Showing a young kid, and I, by that I mean, let's say a ninth grader, what a college application looks like for them to say, how do you want to look when you apply to college? On the other hand, how many 13 or 14 year olds actually have that vision? So I throw that out to you. Right. I think that exercise can help some children for sure. I think as you start to see your child in eighth and ninth grade, you know, being turned on by different things, then as parents, we could point them in directions that we might know about, inter you know, experiences and opportunities that can help them fulfill their passions. If they are deeply empathetic, you might point them towards service. If they're deeply social, you might point them towards student government and, and let them, you know, sort of stretch their muscles there as leaders in their community. Um, you know, the person that they are on a team, on a sports team, are they the ones always looking out for the younger players? Are they the organized ones? Are they the ones, you know, selling t-shirts? There are definitely ways within these experiences that are more typical to help understand and articulate what your child is best at. So I have a question about this. Those uh, qualities that you are referencing, how do we show them? Is that through the letter of recommendation? Uh, tell us. The way that I like to think about the application, which is really, I guess, what you're talking about now, you know, sort of you're at this place now where you're going to be, you know, packaging, articulating, you know, is to use a series of, of brainstorming exercises and people in the child's life. And you might start with, you know, tell me about all the things you were passionate about right from your, your youngest self when you could just play. What do your parents say about you? 
What are your best strengths? What are you most proud of? What are your superpowers? And then when you start to see some of the same things, right, you start to really be able to shape what this child could bring to a campus. And, and that's how you can sort of create a story and a narrative around a student and what they will bring. That and is that the packaging process? So that's yes. 11th grade ish. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let's go back a little bit before that. And things one parents can encourage their kid to do before they really get into that pro process, like clean up your social media, have a decent um, uh, email address. <laughs> Uh, what what and, and I'll let you explain that and what else I'm missing on that. Well, some of these really tactical things are helpful, right? Um, so kids need to know that everything that they put out in the world and on the internet um, lives there uh, forever. And um, we've probably all heard of unfortunate circumstances where you know kiddos have put something out that results in them having an offer rescinded. Um, and so I think as parents, that's something we need to be conscious of is just being a good digital citizen and not putting anything out into the world that, you know, you wouldn't want your college admissions officer or your grandmother to see. <laughs> so I think that is definitely one. On a practical level, kids need to start using email. They need to start having their own personal email separate from their school email account. It's great to have them practice this with coaches, with, you know, other programs, and just get them used to writing formal emails and monitoring their email. I've heard of many, many, many students missing opportunities because they just don't check their email um, because they, they're, that's not the way they're used to communicating. So we have to start training that for sure. So I'd like to go into a question I have about um, just some basic vocabulary. What is ED? one and two, what is uh, the other types of uh, processes that take you through uh, applying? These are the lingo that we have to start speaking. Right, right. And there's really a, sort of an application strategy when you think of different schools and applying to different schools. So let me just run through some of the different options quickly. There's something called rolling admissions, which is basically that, you know, the school opens up admissions and you ideally want to get your application in there quickly because rolling means exactly that. They're reviewing applications and rolling out their decisions. And so once they run out of space, they're going to run out of space. So if you are excited about a rolling admissions school, you want to get that application in early. Speaking of early, there's early decision and early action. In both of those cases, you're going to apply first, usually in November, and you're going to hear first, November, uh, sorry, December, January, typically. Early decision is a binding agreement between you and the school, such that if you are accepted, you are going to that school. Now, there's an asterisk there that if they don't meet all of the financial need that your family has um, that you can you can you can you know back yourself out of that agreement, but your your school counselor signs that, your parents sign that, and you the student sign that binding agreement, and that is a an opportunity for the school to to see your commitment. But so let me just binding. stop. You can back out for financial reasons. Yes, that's really the only acceptable way to back out of uh, of, a, of an early decision if the school is not able to meet meet your financial needs. Early action is early application, early notification, but not binding. So you can you can do that in, in many schools. And I, I should have said that the early decision you can only do at one school. Early action, multiple. And then there's a regular decision, which is usually a January deadline. And usually you find out in you know, February through April. There's a new wish. Um, some of the very, very selective schools have something called single choice early action which is non-binding but mo in those cases most of them ask you to take yourself out of the pool of any other school except for a public institution so it's a it's a it's a it's a only the very most elite schools are doing that so that because they don't want to compete with each other and ed2 so yeah ed2 right. ED2, more and more schools are introducing, this is again, that binding decision, 
but now schools are um, moving the deadline. So ED2 usually deadlines are in January. And so what that does, when you think of your applicant, your student, they may fall in love with the school, they submit their early decision one, they find out middle of December, maybe that decision didn't go their way and schools have an ED2 in January and you think, okay, I, I can fall in love with another school and I have a really good shot. So I'm gonna go ahead and submit an early decision two application to a different. How do you decide whether you should be applying early decision? I think there are a lot of families that think, oh, I ha we have to have an ED school. We have to have an ED school. And I think that they do that because mathematically, you can improve your chances. Now, I do want to say that you can improve your chances, but not if you're not qualified. You, you have to be a qualified applicant. So to answer your, your question, Mara, I think if you have a school that is far and away your top choice, far and away, you are able to walk away from the opportunity to consider multiple financial aid packages. So that doesn't mean you have to be able to afford a full ride but you're willing to you know, take the risk that you'll work with this one school, then it, it, can, it can help your chances in terms of the statistics of applying ED. But a lot of kids you know, don't have that front runner that they wanna make that big commitment to, and there's nothing wrong with not applying ED somewhere and keeping your options open. How many schools do kids now apply to? Because it's varied over the years. It's grown in the last... 20 years, the introduction of the common application caps students' applicants at uh, applications at 20. So 15 years ago, children would have been applying to six to 10 schools. That number is now in the 12 to 15 schools. Um, I would love, I would have loved it if, if the common app had, you know, decreased the, the number to about 15 max, because I just think that it's really, really hard to put a very thoughtful, deliberate, well-researched application into 20 schools. And you've both gone through the process. You know all of the work that goes into right, the it. Extra you know, the yes, extra the essays. The supplemental essays are the killer. But let me ask you this, and forgive me if I sound cynical, but is this really required or is it the schools wanting it to increase the number of, they can say how many students applied to their particular university? I just want to make sure I understand your question. Are the supplement are the supplementals? No, nothing to do with the essays. Mm -hmm. But you know, schools want you to apply to them because then they can say we had three million applications, even though if they have no intention of taking any more than the five hundred they planned. Right, and rec recruitment of applicants is a big business now. And your mailboxes are probably inundated. If you've got a college junior or senior, their inboxes, if you haven't taken a look at your child, if you have a junior who has taken the ACT or the SAT and you haven't taken a peek at their inbox, you would be amazed at the emails that they're getting every day from colleges. It's big business to fill the top of the funnel so that you can look like you are very selective. And um, schools are are constantly looking to to uh, to to grow that applicant pool, even though they're not growing the spots at the bottom, so that they look more selective. To your point, and increase their rankings. Yes, and Salingo touches on that in his book. Students who said, "Well, wait, they pursued me, they sent me things, and I got a free application, and then they're denied." But I want to skip to something else that's been uh, part of what we've discussed how your high school factors into this whole process. Why don't you tell us your opinion of how the uh, high school is part of your college application profile? Right, I think, you know, as parents, we, we think of our, our, our children as unique, but what we really need to think about is the way that the admission process works. And the way that the admissions teams review is that they usually review often by high school. Most every high school makes public. So if you've got a child in high school, you can Google it. Uh, it's a published document in most cases. And it provides a lot of context for the admissions team about what opportunities for rigor your child had, what AP classes. Often there'll be score distribution. There'll be GPA distribution. There'll be uh, stats on how many kids go to four-year colleges. And so 
before an admissions officer reads for one particular high school, they refresh themselves on this profile. And so your, your child's high school is really, or your child's, your child's status as a, as a candidate is really contextual of their high school opportunities. Because when you think about it, there are rigorous schools with multiple IB and AP programs, all the way down to schools that offer none, down to you know homeschool. And so, you know, admissions officers need to understand the context of each applicant within their high school community to really assess. And that profile, there's also these programs like Naviance and Score, is it, uh, is another one. And if you look at the scattergram of where kids got into, and you don't know what the dots on the uh, cobweb are uh, in the program, but you can see what the child's GPA was, what their scores were, and where they got into. Now, how can we utilize those that information to, to support us in our que child's quest? Right. And thank you for bringing that up. For anyone who doesn't know what a scattergram is, it's basically an, an X and Y axis, and you've got green dots plotted um, and red dots plotted. And the green dots are the acceptances based on stats, and the red dots are the rejections based on stats. And each high school software program is limited to their students. So you'll be able to see for any particular college, how did students from my high school perform in terms of applications? And one of the things that I love to show students is to plot themselves right on that graph and then toggle back and forth between the red and the green. And sometimes you can be surrounded by green and think, wow, I've got a great chance. And then you toggle to the red and you're surrounded by red and you think, wow, you know, it, you are, you can be equally qualified. And sometimes a, a child's stats aren't necessarily what them, gets them admitted. Your stats can get you considered, but really it's all of the, you know, other parts of the application, who you are and what you bring um, that, that can, can lead to admission. And before we jump to another question, I just wanted to point out something that was profiled in the book that uh, he points to Harvard and, uh, you know, another prestigious college where nearly every student took calculus. But as the author went on to point out, only something like 50 percent of high schools in the United States offer any form of calculus. So the rigor of your high school can have a direct correlation to your opportunities. Are you better at better being at a larger high school that perhaps is more diverse and being the top of your class than being at some place where everyone is just like you and are there quotas um for each high school like we will only take three people this year from high school x i do i do and I, i'll start with the quota question um because i think a lot of people believe that there are quotas but they're they're really um, as far as you know, everything that, they, that the high schools and the colleges um, will speak about publicly, there are not quotas. There are definitely good relationships between certain high schools and certain colleges, and that can be fostered over years of sending a college really well prepared, qualified applicants who come onto that campus and really thrive and contribute to that campus. And when you think about it's such a human process. The counselors are humans and the admission reps are humans. And so if you and I get to know each other over the course of many years and, you know, Maura, you're sending me wonderful students um, that matriculate, that enroll, that's going to help me as the admissions rep do my job. And so there's definitely uh, relationships that can be fostered that can help a child's uh, chances at a school if there's a good relationship there. Well, also, but you raised an interesting point there that they send the students that actually come. How important is that history that the people who apply and are accepted from a specific high school actually go because there's a there's that they're rated on that when they're accept, you know how many people actually attend. That's right. We um, we tend to think of you know selectivity as just acceptance rate. Um, but schools care deeply about what they call yield, deeply. And so just for, for folks listening who may not understand what yield means, yield means how many, what percentage of students who are invited 
actually enroll. So if there's, if there's 100 places and a school sends out, you know, 200 applications, you know, so many, many, many schools have to in, invite three or four students to fill for one. Um, and and the, the better your yield, the more selective that, that you can be. So schools care very deeply about their yield. So it often seems that students from a specific school are all applying to the same school. I mean, everyone's applying to the same schools. What do you do? I mean, they're not going to take 25 kids from a high school of with a senior class of 150. We call this the sub-competition. If you were to read the profile of the college, a parent and a student might say, oh, you're going to fit right in. But for some reason, they just can't take all of those kids. How does that work? And, and I, I'm going to go back to your point, Christy, about the scattergram, right? And so if, if you know that a lot of kids from your school happen to go and apply to a specific college, maybe you're going to take a peek at where you fit. And if you're not solidly in that sort of upper quadrant, then, you know, maybe apply to that school um, and see if they're looking for what uniquely you bring. Um, so I don't want to discourage anyone from applying in the current um, but there's an, also an opportunity to present some diversity by looking beyond the schools that most of the kids in your area are applying to. Now, there's a bit of um, maybe a bit of tension because if you are applying to a school halfway across the country and that admissions rep is not that familiar with your high school, you know, they're going to have to learn a little bit more. Um, and they may not be as comfortable. You're, you're not a known entity, your high school, for example. But schools really do like to bring in kids from different regions. And so you can offer geographic diversity by applying, if you're willing to go and you have the means to travel back and forth, by looking beyond the you know 20 to 30 colleges that most of the kids in your community apply to. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity um, to create a, you know something unique and, and offer a school something unique. So lingo boils this down to colleges that are buyers and sellers, right? And the sellers are the haves in the admissions and the buyers are the, the nots. And he pointed out that if you did a little bit of you know, research, there's, there are many schools that have very similar acceptance stats to the, the, uh, you know, the seller schools, but they're in the buyer category. I mean, two examples he gave are Carnegie Mellon and Ohio Case Western Reserve. How do people find these little gems that may be outside of what everyone else is looking for? So you can Google, Jeff Salingo has done an incredible job um, sorting those schools and you can Google, he's, he's let that, all of that data um, just available for anyone to see. Now, a buyer school, um, actually, I'll start with a seller school. The seller schools have something that everybody wants. And so the way that he built his analysis was uh, around aid, financial aid. And so seller schools don't need to discount their tuition to attract talented candidates, whereas buyer schools do need to attract talented candidates by offering discounts to compete with schools that might be perceived as slightly more prestigious, slightly better brands, not necessarily and not often better quality education to your point. Are so, you talking about bigger financial packages? You're talking about merit aid or do they play together? The way that Jeff Salingo did his analysis is, um, and there's, there's, there's many schools that are very selective who give absolutely no merit. The most selective schools uh, and I think a lot of parents don't appreciate this before they go in. And, and this is why that buyers and sellers analysis is really, really helpful. Because if you need to think about having a diverse list of colleges, financial diversity you know, also needs to be something that parents would want to consider. And so um, taking a look at those schools that give merit, to your point, Mara, those are the ones that want to attract the talent. And that is irrespective of the family's need. Merit aid is for uh, for achievement, and and aid uh, or scholarship is based on need. And if you are the Harvard of the world, you don't really need to attract talented candidates. You can use all of your dollars 
to offer scholarship and aid to those who need it. So going to his analysis, I, I, I didn't even know it was available online. I only read the book. So now I'm going to have to Google this. But it's a really good point that his analysis focusing on who gives money actually says something about the school wanting your student, irrespective of whether you need the money or not. There's something validating to say, hey, you're a good candidate. We like you. Here's $10,000 or more. So I, I really like uh, that analysis. I've got a question. Talk to but, us but about Wait, it. Christy, I'm sorry. Yeah. Before you leave that, but is that the right way for parents to look at it? Do you? Does it matter if the school expresses a commitment to a student through money? I think it matters based on the parent's ability to pay full ride or not for sure. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are there are families who are fortunate to be able to take financial um, out of the equation and really just look for the, the place where their child will thrive. And then there are, you know, for most of the families in the United States, the, the, the rising cost of college means that that is the first thing that they need to think about. Is can we afford it? And so if you have a child who can earn a merit scholarship, this can really be helpful. Well, yeah. I'm just going to be the naysayer here. <laughs> I know from some of my children that got money or didn't, they felt validated by getting that scholarship, to be honest. And so personally, I think that's a, a component that can make the student feel like they, they mean something for going there, especially if it's merit-based. Um, talk to us about testing. What is happening today? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, first I'll say that there were a lot of test optional schools before COVID. So I'll just, I'll just say that. Um, COVID really threw a ringer into testing. And now as we emerge from that and students can now readily, you know, avail themselves of testing opportunities, we are seeing some schools reapproach testing. Some schools have gone back. Purdue, MIT, not test optional anymore. There are some schools who are now saying we're test optional, but we like to see the data point. And then there are some schools who are saying we just haven't seen it as uh, evidence that it improves the student's success and graduation rate. And so we don't necessarily need it. We know that it is um, something that that Families with means can prepare for improved scores. So we knew it was noisy from the beginning in terms of a student's potential. And so I think that um, we're about to see, you know, a major shift in the next five to 10 years. It might be interesting that standardized testing may end up going away by and large. Um, right now, the way that I would counsel families to think about testing with their high school students is to go ahead and take the test, um, prep as much time and energy and financial um, opportunities you have so that you have the scores because it just leaves opportunities if your child wants to go to that school that does prefer testing, you know, you haven't closed any doors. So if your child can take the test without too much mental anguish, if they score well, great. If they don't, you don't need to use it. But Okay, we're making this black and white, score score well, don't score well. There's also doing pretty good. Um, how do we gauge whether our pretty good is going to be enough for the school and whether we should the students should throw those numbers in? Right. As if you look at the published averages of SAT and ACT over the last few years, you need to really appreciate that those scores are only, right, the best test takers who are submitting scores. So those averages are have gone way up and will continue to go up in the world of test optionality. If only the best test takers are submitting scores, then those numbers are just going to keep going up until every school looks like they have nothing but 1,600. And so there's a lot of noise in that. There's, um, there's, a, there's something called the common data set that every single college has, it's public. You can dive into that common data set in section C and you'll be able to see what percentage of students submitted scores. Hmm. 
So I always have families take a look and, and it's been less than half at most colleges since the, the pandemic. But we can also so, get this from that Naviance and the other uh, program. So it's particular to our high school, correct? It's particular to the high school. Not everything goes the way the parents or even the student want it to go. Kid bombs the standardized testing. They screw up grade wise. They get arrested. I mean, it could any number of things could happen. Kids are kids. Kids are kids. What do you do? I mean, because there can be a feeling like, oh my God, what you know, it's over, game over. Talk to us about how it. Thank you. Hopefully, that it's not. Thank you, thank you, thank you for asking this question because I think what most parents really want to hear is that their child's going to be okay. Um, so just a statistic that I like to share with parents, almost 75% of colleges accept more than half of their students, of their applicants. There are over 4,000 colleges in the United States. There is a place for every child, every child. Um, we tend to we tend to think one C on the transcript and the entire future needs to be thrown away and we need to reevaluate everything. But there are so many paths to a happy and fulfilling life. Um, and we need to share these stories with our kids more often, I think, than we do. And again, in the book, they touch upon the fact that hundreds of seats are left unfilled in May. And we can't get totally sucked into the drama that if you don't get your acceptance before Christ Christmas, life is over. And we're, we're painting this as like the dire situation. Lots of things happen. Kids get mono in high school and they lose a whole year by being too tired and not doing well. We can't just fall into the trap of thinking life is over. You know, how, how, do, how do you counsel parents to handle those situations? Well, I think, you know, each of us puts our child's mental and, and physical well-being first. And, 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 and that's really, I think, what you're touching on is that if, you know, things go off the rails um, in terms of the child's academics, all is definitely not lost. And there can be so much growth and reflection that can come from any experience like that. There are plenty of opportunities for gap years, different ways to finish high school, college opportunities that are really, really unique. Um, and, you know, we just look a little farther afield than the, you know, top 100 schools that everybody uh, is really just thinking about when when thinking about college. So there, there are plenty of opportunities. We all, though, want our kid the best for our kids. I think that's generally, we can say that fairly better uh, about most parents. And let's say you want your kid to go to your alma mater, whatever it is, and your kid or your kid wants to go, having heard the stories about how it was the best time of your life, they've been to the campus a million times. What do you do? Do you, do you push that? And of course, it depends which school and, and how elite it is and difficult. But are we setting them, set them up for possible disappointment? I, I, think that, I think that we can be, certainly. Um, you know, the, the family that... Um, has had their child sporting the jersey since they were a toddler, really can set that child up for, for disappointment, especially as some of these schools have gotten more and more and more competitive, for sure. Um, so I think we do have to be very careful um, with the way that we position their college experience as uniquely theirs and really parking our own attachment to where they go to school um, and, um, and, and not not trying to tie our own, and it's this is easier said than done, but really not trying to tie our own egos up in our children's success. <laughs> or at least not where they went to college. Right. One of the things that I often find lacking in the conversations about college, to me somewhat surprisingly, is what's the best school for your child? What do they need? And how do you get parents and students to think about that beyond the highly branded, highly elite schools? You know, one of the things that when you think about the most elite schools and then you think about your child, right? Many of us are so driven by getting our child into, quote unquote, the best school that they can get into 
proxy for that is most selective. Can you imagine your child in a class where they are you know, just struggling to keep above water? If you asked your class, what, it, would it, what would it feel like to be in a class with only valedictorians, right? Is your child really going to thrive in that uber selective environment and you know have, has your child struggled in high school and now you think that perhaps this is where they ought to be but you know separating that really understanding how your child likes to learn they like to learn in big big lectures and, and absorb information do they like small class discussions starting to think about where are you, you know, where are you most yourself? How do you, do you like writing papers? Do you like taking tests? Um, do you like having lots of opportunities? Are you adventurous and want to go abroad? These are the kinds of things I think that start to shape the conversation. And instead of starting the conversation with a list of schools, let's in start, instead start with a lot of introspection, reflection, right? Before you even introduce a single brand name, what does your child want out of a college experience? And if you can sort of build that list and call that the North Star, then you can enter into, okay, what does that look like so on the college you, landscape? Do you then find those schools by Googling those programs, qualities? I mean, I always think of Steve Jobs learning, taking a calligraphy class and that's how he got fonts. Uh, so that's the kind of learning I want my child to have uh, so they can grow and create amazing things. So how do we find those schools that have those things to offer? To me, the most um, helpful guide that I think every single family of a high schooler should have is called the FISC guide, F-I-S-K-E. Um, I can remember when this book was first introduced to me because it is it, it weighs about eight pounds. It's very, very thick. You know, my first reaction was, you know, why would anyone buy a book when everything's on the Internet? But this book written by Edward Fisk for many, many years is the only consumer review of the college experience. It is not marketing material published by the school. It is not a ranking based on, you know, a, a data model. This is a qualitative and quantitative snapshot of what life is like on that campus. And each school, there's over 400 schools in the book, has about a page and a half. Really, to me, that's where every family and every child should start. And if they can read that and get a little turned on by a school, then you add it to your list. You dive deeper. That sounds so much better to the partying guide to colleges. I'm going to look for that. So, Carrie, can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm working with Thrive Tutoring, T-H-R-I-V-E Tutoring. And so you can find me there and book a free one-hour consultation. I can walk you through the road to college if you have a younger child, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, and you just want to understand what the next few years should look like, what we should be thinking about as, as parents. And also, if you're a little closer to that college experience, I'm happy to help parents think about where um, where their child maybe would best fit and, and, and set you on a plan. You have given us so much information today. Thank you. And just for our listeners, they can find us at thebalancedilemma.com where our episodes can be found, newsletter, announcements, things like that. And we are wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram to connect with us. I'm Christy Derrico. This has been great. And Maura Carlin, thank you for listening. And thank you, Carrie. Thank you.